Now, I talked a little bit before about uh, a guy named Hernando de Soto and his book, uh, The Mystery of Capital, and why it is so important at the, at the base of all fruitful, all productive economies, there are property rights. But traditionally, it's out there in the, you know, the so-called real world, but now we have to think about property rights and how they work. And that will influence how economies work and how we will build value, something we really have to get our heads around. Our next panel is going to help us to do that. It is going to be led by Yanni Collins. Yanni Collins is the uh, PR director with Oz Living, and she is going to be coming on up here with a couple of great speakers who are going to walk us through the basics of this, getting deep into the topic. It's Michael Tom, the CEO from Exterio. We've also got Evan Ao Young, the president of Animoca Brands, and they are going to be taking us into the Web3 world. Thank you very much, Yanni. Take it away. Thanks, Andrew. All right, everybody, this is the last day of WOW Summit, and thanks for coming out. Uh, thank you also to WOW Summit for graciously hosting us and for doing all the amazing work behind the scenes. I really applaud you for that. My name is Yanni Collins. I'm the media and PR director for Oz Living, and welcome to this fireside chat. It is very timely to be discussing this at the moment because in recent years, we've seen an explosive growth in uh, virtual economies and uh, the concept of virtual ownership, especially with gamers and collectors alike, you know, purchasing and trading digital goods and digital assets for millions and millions of dollars. And this is not just happening in a gaming space, nor this is a sci-fi dream come true. This is an entirely new economy that we'll be discussing at the moment. And as technology only continues to advance, the possibilities for virtual economies and ownership is just becoming increasingly limitless, um, especially with blockchain and NFTs paving the way for new forms of value and ownership. Now, before we get into the specific questions, I'm so honored to be sitting down with Michael and Evan, uh, two of the uh, experts in this field, and also they represent the biggest and most influential companies in the blockchain gaming space. So Michael and Evan, thank you so much for being here. Let us start with your introduction. Tell us about yourself and your background. Yeah, so I'm uh, Evan Ao Yang. I'm the group president of Animoca Brands. Um, I have, um, I guess, uh, uh, been in the company for a couple of years to uh, look at how do we scale the organization, uh, sharpen the strategy, uh, I guess, make some investments. Uh, built some uh, built some great products, right? We have three pillars. Uh, we have the operating arm and the sandbox. Sebastian is uh, one of our, uh, our early uh, subsidiary, subsidiary companies. Uh, we have a uh, 400 in our portfolio. Uh, that's the investment side. That's our pillar two. So we have we have two funds. One early stage. One is a growth stage fund. And then uh, we also we also do advisory uh, services. Fantastic and. And I'm Michael, and uh, I'm the CEO of Exterio. Exterio is a web free game publishing platform. I myself have been in the game industry for more than 20 years and publishing all kinds of games from PC and MMORPGs to the latest strategy games on mobiles um, in China and outside of China as well. And um, it's very excited to be here together with Yanni and also Evan. All right, let us start with the first question um, and with the market overall. How do you see the concept of ownership evolving and changing the landscape of the video game industry? Let's start with that. Well, the, uh, the landscape, obviously, you know, um, Michael have a very strong point of view on that because he's building a platform, right, ultimately. But for us, um, we really see in, in the way we look at games and we, we began as a... Uh, um, sort of like a mobile gaming cover, uh, uh, a builder, right? And then we sort of venture into a blockchain space because we believe that ultimately digital asset ownership is really ultimately what's going to be the future of what we see. So in th about 2017, uh, late 2017, we started distributing uh, uh, crypto kitties, and we discovered that digital asset ownership is uh, what people actually ultimately want, right? And uh, the future of uh, gaming and video games, we believe that is ultimately ownership of time that you actually would uh, want to value. And uh, given that, um, you don't want your data be, uh, to be uh, necessarily mined and be just utilized and your time to be just used for entertainment. You want to use it, put it in good use. And if you're putting time into it, you should have a, a slice of uh, what you con where your contributions are. 
So our uh, version of the Web3 world is that once you own digital asset, you can uh, obviously free compose upon that. And obviously, you own uh, uh, by having uh, a piece of that uh, governance. You have that. Uh, you have the right to participate. You have the right to to vote. Eventually, I think these ecosystems all become DAOs, um, and um, and we believe that's a much better uh, vision of the internet as we see it. Beautiful said. And Michael. Uh, yes, um, I think the only thing I want to add is that even in the Web two world or traditional game world. There are a lot of games that people find that ownership is very important. For example, there is a game called CSGO, which has been around for many, many years. Um, if you look at the news, CSGO's some of the weapons are being sold in the marketplace for more than 100,000 US dollars. I think the main reason for that is that people trust the platform or trust the game that is continue to be run or to be, continue to be operated. So there has always been demand for gamers to have actual ownership of the games uh, or game items on the digital assets. Um, but what is lacking is that a lot of the games has not been operated for a very long time, and they kind of <coughs> close down, or you know something happened, or you know there are not many players in it. Then um, they will found that digital assets become value uh, to, to to become loose values. So I think with blockchain and with Web3, um, we can make sure that the trust and then the longevity of these games will be there forever, and also preserving the values of the ownership of these uh, games items. Yeah, uh, just building on top of this, I am a gamer myself. I've been playing video games uh, for years, and just um, like, Sometimes I feel like those in-game assets are mine, but technically it's not, right? But like the blockchain gaming allows me to have and take ownership for those in-game assets, and that is verifiably mine. So I think that's the value of ownership in there. Um, let's go to the next question. One of the biggest challenges facing in-game economies is the increasing complexity of a variety of virtual currencies, like items and other assets that can be traded or sold um, sold within the game, making it difficult for players to understand the true value of these assets. And so how can, from a high level perspective, how can we ensure that players are able to make informed decisions about the value of virtual assets? And what role can technology and data analytics play in creating a more transparent and fair system? Let's start with Evan. Sure. I mean, you know, um, so we, we obviously have many assets, and uh, we are really in charge of uh, focusing on the economies, right? Ultimately, the question that you're asking pertains to how do you balance uh, gaming economic systems, right? And these really are economic systems. And it's not really just about blockchain cryptocurrencies that these economies exist. In, in fact, in Web2 uh, gaming ecosystems, those still exist. The, 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 the economies of those uh, gaming systems also need to balance, right? But once you connect the crypto layer to it where, it, where you can actually take things out and externalize and, be, and be, there's real discoverable value that can connect to real world, then you have that layer of market volatility in it that you have to deal with, right? I mean, many of the ecosystems that we have seen that has not really worked out uh, uh, you know, perfectly uh, really has to do with the, the sinks and the faucets that we talk about, right? So, you know, what, what do you have? Uh, are you are you inflationary, deflationary? Do you have uh, do you have uh, way too much uh, faucet uh, relative to the sinks? And there are even some uh, projects that are really on the on the OG scale, like for instance, like even Cool Cats, etc., uh, that have uh, you know unlimited emission or that, that there needs to be uh, uh, those aspects need to be fixed as well, right? But if you look at um, uh, overall ecosystems that have actually tended to turn uh, to, to have done well in the beginning, it's more to do with the supply and demand ultimately. It's again the in the faucets, that has to do with that if you have more uses for it, you would naturally have an appreciation of that particular token, right? And if the token or the utility itself doesn't attract players, or it just becomes a thing that is a, a kind of like a short-term phenomenon, then you see the volatility coming up or down, right? So for us, ultimately, we do advisory services, right? Token advisory. We look at the overall balance. So you put it through different models, economic models, to see how it actually balances. And you actually have to actually um, run it through different models to see. And there are external vendors that can that actually allows uh, uh, you to run through models, right? But ultimately, the way we look at it is that 
for these game economies to balance, it's, it really cannot be just built, be built on pure speculation, right? Because you're trying to get a, uh, a community going, right? And that community is investing in this space, which means that you invest in that space by your time and capital as well, but you don't look to immediately take it out. So play to earn has really evolved into play and earn as a result, right? So that's sort of how we see as the future. How about you, Michael? What's your perspective on this? Yeah, I can add something as well. I think at the end of the day, it's about transparency, right? Assuming that we can see real-time numbers of the treasury of, let's say, Credit Suisse or SVB, then people will know what is going to happen next, right? And people will be, you know, as transparency, transparency is everything. So I think the best thing about blockchain or Web3 is that for transparency, that we know exactly what is the treasury is like for the supply and the demand of the tokens in that game or in that whatever project it is. And you know, we can see the velocity, we can see the number of users and, and many things, so on and so forth, so that people can decide or the users can decide whether they want to continue to invest their time or money into the games, but um, or is it time to, you know, take out their deposits. Yeah, and one thing that is great about Web3 is that it's transparent, right? Because a lot of the data is on chain. Of course, the, the Web2 data is still, uh, you know, you can still look at it through Web2 tools, right? About engagement and all that stuff. But everything that happens to the token and assets that gets traded are all on chain, right? So it's super transparent. Super, yes. Um, I want to move on. What kind of new business models do you think will emerge as a result of in-game economies and virtual ownership? Do you want to take your first um, one? Maybe I can take it first, right. So I, I think um, one, two of the questions that we always ask, especially for traditional game developers, is how Web3 is going to increase the experience or improve the experience of the users. And also, how would that improve our business as well, right? Um, so there are a few things that we've been looking at. Um, for example, there is a game called Fantasy Westward Journey, which has been running around for, in China for more than 18 years. Um, the idea is very simple. Um, because everyone is charged by hours, so all the things that you can farm or you can get inside a game has to be done by hours rather than you just pay money. So for those people who have money but no time, they will have to ask or they will have to buy it from the farmers of these gamers, right? Um, and also, those, these people can use these items or, you know, a very, very powerful weapon to be able to, you know, kill, like, bosses and game monsters and things like that. So it becomes a very positive loop or cycle for the rich with no time and the, you know, for people who have more time and to have a very good cycle. And this game has been running for more than 18 years, and the inflation for this game is only two, about 3% per year for the last 18 years. So it's, especially with Web3, I think that makes a lot more sense because the marketplace would be more transparent, uh, would be more liquid, liquid. and so, so I think it's, it's important. Um, it's, it's quite possible for this kind of model. Um, another model that we can think of easily is that any games that requires wager. So you, we, they have, uh, you know, there is a game called Escape from Tarkov in the Web2 world where players will bring in their weapons and to you know, fight in the section, right? And the winner is going to loot or to take the loser's weapons after the game, uh, when they win the game, right? So this, these weapons obviously will become NFTs um, and can be traded on the secondary marketplace. Um, I think this is one area where Web3 has actually less friction compared to Web2, because in Web2 world, um, most of the time people will have to send a, you know, send a link into something like eBay and then borrow the account, and then they may lose the account or stole the account or things like that, and it's very, very uh, dangerous or not secure to do so. So these are just two of the examples that I can uh, um, think of right now. 
Yeah, I mean, the, the notion of uh, interoperability is a pretty important one, right? It's why platforms are built, it's one of your visions as well. Ultimately, it's, um, it's, it's about, Web3 is very open in terms of philosophy, right? So it is really about not, about getting, you're building that thing and then attracting the crowd in and then just kind of like keep them all in. It's really about how do I, you know, create value not only for my own community, but how can I attract your community and how do I contribute build my community to the next community over as well. So if you look at just a, a, a simple project that we did, which is Mochaverse, right? Why, why did we, why did any Mocha launch its own NFT, right? The, the reason we did that is because we feel that we're not large enough, our ecosystem of 400 or so uh, companies is not large enough for us to have an NFT that represents all of us, right? And if you sort of mine the, the wallets that are sort of like, you know, uh, on, on who are the holders of that, uh, and the initial drop, you can see that those who sign up are copied from, from the Board Ape community, they're from Moonbirds, they're from, you know, KuCats, they're from, you know, Azuki. You can, you can just see how these communities actually overlap. Of course, a lot of them are from our own ecosystem, like Sandbox, like, you know, from Brofish community as well. So you can see that as you are creating that value for community, you actually see the same people. You mine the data, you can see that you're trying to create that value for the community so it's interoperable. And of course, it's just the beginning, but you can see that what we're trying to do is to um, have something that is out there that represents us, that's unique to us, and we'll give it a lot of utility so that the ecosystem can build from there. And that representation, the NFT that we have, uh, is really the start of how we envision the ecosystem ought to be. Yeah, I just want to also share a success story. A month ago, there was this... Um, um, the top ranked Fortnite player who cashed in $1.6 million off of like playing Dookie Dash. Basically, he ranked number one in Dookie Dash and he got this NFT as a prize. And guess what? Uh, a person bought it for 1,000 ETH, which is $1.6 million. So that's kind of like, you know, also like the, you would see the, the, the potential from, from like all these success stories. Um, Anyway, moving on. Uh, in terms of regulations, what are the potential implications of virtual ownership on intellectual property rights or copyright law and related legal frameworks? And what impact will this have on society as a whole if this eventually becomes more widely acceptable, uh, accepted and recognized legally? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, um, the, 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 the regulatory part of it is really uh, at its nascent stages at this point in time. It's great to see, by the way, we're in Hong Kong. Um, it's great to see that a financial hub, which is globally known one in Hong Kong, first of all, we allow travel, which is a great thing, right? So it's great to see, you know, everyone here, right, for the for first time in a long time in the in the Web three conference, right? And uh, uh, great to see that. Secondly. Uh, the Hong government has sort of committed that it wants to build a virtual assets hub here. And that's a big deal because, you know, Hong Kong actually has a very strong regulatory regime in the financial space, right? It's one that is globally known and it wants to regulate. It wants to have a piece of that. And regulation is very important because, you know, as any Mocha brands, we look at sort of KYC, AML, CTF. Those things are very, very important to us because when you have um, uh, any kind of, uh, financial assets moving around, you need to have those uh, guardrails in place in order for the, for the, uh, for the uh, whole space to grow. Whereas, uh, unfortunately, some other jurisdictions, like for instance in, um, in other large Western markets, which we know what we're talking about, right? Uh, they are sort of enforcing by, by pr uh, prosecution, which doesn't give it regulatory clarity, right? At the end of the day, any innovation comes risks, right? And in the good old days, back in the 90s, I remember when I was in college, I'm that old, I didn't even have internet, right? We have to go to, like, when you go to, we have to go to a company room to, to use emails at that point in time. And in the late 90s, there were a lot of people who were saying that, who needs the internet, right? We can go to library, search information, all that. And everybody went into it in the dot-com era. Everything dot-com, you go after the name of that dot-com mixed money, and then there's a big burst of it thereafter, right? And then there are a lot of articles that says the internet is dead, no one needs the internet. Now, the same thing is what people might say when there's a lot of volatility in the Web3 space, but we know that, you know, this is a huge deal. The digital asset ownership is a huge deal. You look at how we spend time, you know, how the youngsters, have what they value, they don't value the hard assets anymore. It's a generational shift. So regulations need to catch up to this fact that rather than sort of like, sort of kill the space, right? 
Um, actually, I want to link back to your question on number three and number well, the, the last two questions about the copyright and the business model. Uh, I mean, I want to give an example. For example, if you uh, look at the, you know, the music that is being played, uh, you know, in restaurants or so on, in karaoke or so on, right? Um, you know, the performance, the performers, the lyrics, and the music arrangement will each get a different shares of the money um, they are generated, right? So usually it's like 70% on the performance and maybe 15% on the lyrics and so on. And it's a fixed fee and is, um, you know, executed or, you know, uh, make sure it's policed by the government to make sure that this money goes to cash, which is like the composers and, I forgot the whole name, it's like a composers and singers association, something like that, right? And, but with blockchain, I think one of the good things about blockchain is that assume in a world that everything is blockchain and everything is like police by the computers as well, then I can write my music and then I write into my contract or the smart contract that whoever is going to use my music for performances, I can get my shares of the money, but I don't have to rely on you know the cash you know cash meaning like the composers association on they collecting the money for me but the money actually goes directly into my wallet and i can decide what percentage i want or how much money i want so this is like very far in the future but i think it's a very very good thing for all the creators in the future yeah, so I just have an echo that is super important as a point, right? Because of creators' royalties and creator fees are something that we are actively defending as well. Some marketplaces, because of competition, and we know marketplaces are being a little bit commoditized, they've sort of gone in a way of saying that, hey, you know, optional royalty fees and all that. Ultimately, if you're signing towards sort of your commodities and NFTs as trading, like almost like a fungible token, I think it damages the space of creativity. It sort of gets to the point where the space is really only, you know, heading towards sort of trading volume and speculation. Whereas where the builders here, we really want to see great use cases. And the people, the creators, artists, gamers, they're not here to just make a living, right? That's part of it, but then ultimately, that royalty that you talk about is super powerful because it really allows the people or creators to enter the space, right? And they want to be here because they're ultimately rewarded through a market discovery mechanism. The first Picasso, right? The first Picasso that he sold is probably not worth a lot. But, a, but the last time that same piece of Picasso was sold, it's worth a lot of money, right? But he and his family, you know, never get a sense, never got a cent out of it. Now you put it on the chain, right? It's, it's, forever, it's permanent, it really allows real creators to then shape the world, which is what we want ultimately, yeah. right? Okay, fantastic. And I think, uh, I, I think it's very important to eliminate like, you know, the, the complex terms such as using NFTs and, uh, and, and basically like for, for inclusivity's sake, right? Like for, for everyone to be included as well, it's, it's more on Putting an emphasis on on and putting uh, a talk and discussion on what it's really like to own something on the internet, I think that is that is more value rather than having this force-fed integration of the, this technology and more having more of like a simple onboarding. Um, that makes sense. It, it does make sense. Yeah, I mean, yeah. You know, on onboarding is very important, right? That's why you see your solutions. I I don't know if Seb talked about onboarding, he thinks about it a lot in Sandbox, and uh, we're also creating a wallet ourselves, a custodian wallet on Web3 called Griffin, right? And there are a lot of uh, new wallets being built today because the onboarding process is important, right? All right, uh, we have two minutes left. I think we can accommodate a few questions from the audiences. Who has some questions? For them both. None? Okay. So who wants to make money in virtual reality? Yeah, okay. <laughs> yes, you raise your hand. Yeah, good. Uh, I just uh, have a small question. Could you give an example of the best play to earn economics uh, for now? The, the best way to earn 
to earn tokenomics are the best way to design token economies. Just an example of the best play to earn tokenomics uh, game nowadays. Uh, well, you know, okay, so tokenomics itself is a, is a study of uh, token economies. So the, the design of it, is, is that the question, or do you mean that, it's, what's the best way to earn tokens? Uh, I mean, the name of the project, of the play to earn project with the best uh, tokenomics model. Oh, the best model. I mean, there, there, are lots of, there are lots of good models out there, honestly, right? But the ones that, that work the best, right, have um, a certain design uh, aspect of it that allows the, um, the, the, the sinks to be more than the faucets, right, ultimately. So are there more ways to spend the token than are there uh, the emissions of the tokens themselves, right? And how that managed, right? So there are many, many examples of, of that, right? Um, uh, ultimately, um, there is a one particular one that we're, we're looking at that we're designing um, that is, again, I don't want to name the names right now, but ultimately, it's about there's an in-game economy itself that's a, that's a bit of a more of a closed economy. And then once it gets uh, converted, once there's a certain um, uh, uh, gathering of those assets, it can be converted into a, a external fungible token. But it's sort of time limited, so there's uh, there's there's gated process to make sure the economy, the in-game economy itself balances and is actually healthy, and then there are gated um, uh, ways to get the currency out as well um, as part of gameplay, uh, and that's I think is a very innovative model of of, of looking looking at things. Now, in the past model where there's a lot of um, um, shall we say. Um, marketing initially, they either buy the NFTs or buy the tokens, it get pumped very, very quickly. And those that tend to be the projects that don't really sustain, and that's what I call the 21, 20, 2021 and early 2022 uh, kind of playbook. And those are the ones that are harder to sort of quote unquote earn money, right? Because those really wouldn't balance. I think it really depends on what you want to achieve, right? I mean, if you want to achieve like very, very quick increase obviously you know even i mean even like um, um in the past there are a lot of token economies based on the rewards is based on the number of users right and obviously those the good thing is that it can explode very fast i mean explode meaning like uh um you know in, in getting more uses very fast but at the same time it, it might explode very fast as well and they are obviously much a better one in a, in a way that is you want more longevity than the rewards is based on time rather than the number of users. So at the set number of time, then you know the rewards is you know is definitive, right? And 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 you know how much rewards is given or tokens is given to the users at the same same period of time, no matter how many number of users, right? And on top of that, then there are games that you know you are seeing um, actual payers for the game, right? Um, you know, payers who are actually buying or demanding tokens to increase their power or to increase the you know whatever power the weapons they have, so that at the same time there are the earners and there are also the payers, right? And <clears throat> and for these ones. Um, frankly, I don't see any successful games as yet, but I think there will be um, that we'll be able to merge earners and payers because that happened before in many of the MMORPGs, especially in China. Um, and then, and then on top of that is a kind of a you know loot box type of, of of games, right? So there are a lot of earners, but at the same time. Um, I mean, if you look at Fortnite, right? Fortnite yearly tournament rewards, I think it's basically based on the pre previous revenue. So they know exactly how much the, these rewards they can give out, right? So in the, I mean, if, if we use that idea or model for Web3 games or play to earn games, so it comes later. So basically we have the revenue and then we decide how much we can, players can earn, right? And this type of model basically will I mean, probably is have a much better longevity, right? So um, I think it's um, because we, we I, I come more from a traditional game development, so I always like use analogy for like the MMORPGs, 
or even Fortnite or some of these games, uh, you know, as a comparison. But I, I can see that there are a lot of possibilities that where we can find uh, longevities in play-to-earn model. All right, that is literally time. Thank you, good sir, for your question. And Evan and Michael, thank you so much. I had such a pleasure and honor to share the stage with you. There are so many really interesting takeaways from, um, from this Hireside chat, so it was such an honor. Um, thank you to Wow Summit, and thank you guys for coming out. Um, I hope you enjoyed the panel.